And with that, I'm going to invite Mike to come up. So let's give him an applause. Thanks, Adrian. There are actually two Woodlawn Parks, so make sure you put in Woodlawn Park Boundary Dam. Otherwise, you might end up at the golf course, not the beach. So you do want to be at the beach. Well, it's summer, but with summer, sometimes you end up running into people that you don't normally expect to run into, right? I remember when I was in school that uh, when I would run into a teacher, it was just weird in the summer. They'd be in shorts, and it was just weird, right? So I have a couple jokes about running into old teachers. I ran into my old statistics professor. What are the chances? <laughs> ran into my old music teacher. There were major changes, and we had a sharp conversation. Ran into my old math teacher. I prayed for him. Seems he always has a problem. There, you can use those. Teachers, hopefully you can use those. Last week we talked about who God is. And so if you could show that slide, please, Harley, that slide about who he is. He is Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. He is Jehovah Rapha, our Lord who heals. He is El Shaddai, God Almighty. He is the Lord, our banner, our rock, our peace, our shepherd, our righteousness, and so much more. That's who he is. I pray that you keep studying this list of who he is and that God gives you more and more revelation about who he is, about his character and about his heart. It's so important that we know who he is because when we know who he is, we can properly relate to him and we can properly relate him to others. It's so important. Not only do we need to know who he is, but we need to know who we are. It's so important we know who we are in Christ. As Christians, we need to know who we are. Because when we know who we are, we know who we aren't. When we know what we are called to do, then we know what we're not called to do. So the title of today's sermon is Who We Are. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are here. Thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you have given us the word of God that can teach us, that can rebuke us, that can encourage us, that can build us up. And Lord, we pray that you would use your word today to sharpen us. Make us more suited for ministry. Ministry today, ministry every day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, people watching is an enjoyable pastime of mine. Uh, I like to just sit and observe. I like, I like to observe. And I like to wonder what's happening in a person's life. What's going on? Uh, what, what are they going through? What are they thinking? And every once in a while, I even get to meet people, meet new people and, and get to engage with them and ask them some of those questions. What's happening in your life? What, what, what is going on? What, do you, what are you thinking about? What are you struggling with? And over the years of interacting with others, I found that there's a very common theme. I found that people are quick to tell others who they are. And I don't mean about introducing themselves, although that is good. It's good to introduce yourself to people you don't know. But I'm talking about other people, about them telling other people about who, they, who that person is. Right? One person will say to another person, oh, you are smart. You are kind. You are this or you are that. In my life, I've been told pretty much all that there could be told to a person. I'm sure your life is pretty similar. Different people have told me, you're smart, you're stupid, you're kind, you're mean, you're handsome, you're ugly. 
You're a saint. You're evil. You're fast. You're slow. You're tall. You're short. You're skinny. You're fat. You're rich. You're poor. You're strong. And you're weak. People can be kind and people can be cruel. But thankfully, people can also be wrong. They can be misled. They can be biased or even confused about what's important. People can lead us astray and can cause confusion in us. The only one who isn't wrong, who isn't confused about what is important, who isn't misled, is the one who created us. And so he is the one that we will be going to to get our identity about who we are. You're going to get... If you talk to a thousand different people, you'll get a thousand different thoughts about who you are. So we will talk to the one that created us, and he will tell us who we really are. See, the tactics of Satan are to lie, steal, kill, and destroy. He's got four moves. He's good at them, but he's only got four moves. And so if he can lie to us about who we are, if he can steal our identity if he can kill our calling, and if he can destroy our potential simply because we don't know who we are in Christ, then he's disabled us to live effectively for the kingdom of God. Just as we learned that there are many different ways that we can relate to God about who he is from the different names that he has given us in scripture, so too there are lots of verses in the Bible that talk to us of God telling us about who we are in Christ. One of my favorite verses to quote about who we are in Christ is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. As Christians, the life that we had before The life that we lived before we surrendered our lives to him is gone. It's over. It's done. That's all wrapped up. All of it is gone. And we are new creations. We have a new identity. We have new purpose. We have new giftings for ministry. We have a whole new life that's been given to us. That's who we are. Another of my favorite verses that describes us as believers is Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Even though you may have been conceived unintentionally and maybe even it was told of you, you were a mistake. That's not true. You were thought of by God long ago. Long ago. You are not a mistake. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. You were planned by God. Psalms talks even more about this. Psalm 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me? Oh God, they cannot be numbered. God's thinking about you. He thinks about you all the time. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake up, you are still with me. You are are a marvelous masterpiece. You are wonderfully made. That's who you are. Praise God. Another idea expressed in Ephesians 2.10 is that we are created for good 
works. It's easy to get down on ourselves when we get, or we get frustrated with our lack of growth or self-control when you end up not doing what you want to do. But in this verse, and therefore the truth of the matter, is that we have been created for good works. See, I'm my own worst critic. If I'm hanging a picture and I leave too much uh, pencil on the wall because I'm marking it out and, and I forget to erase a pencil mark. Oh, I forgot to erase that. Or if, I, if it's unlevel or uncentered, I notice. If I'm, if I'm driving and I drift a little bit into the, onto the shoulder, drift a little bit maybe into the center lane, if I cut somebody off or if I'm do, going too fast and get a speeding ticket, especially, I remember. And especially when I take out my frustration on other people, when I'm rude, when I'm inconsiderate, when I'm forgetful towards others, I need to remind myself that I'm created for good works. I'm created for good works. My identity is not in my mistakes. I'm a marvelous masterpiece, and so are you. But if we don't know that we're created for good works, if we don't know that, then why should we act any differently? We'll continue to live the life of sin that we have lived if we don't know we're created for good works. Parents of little children and of uh, elementary age children, take note. I did a little bit of research. If a child is told repeatedly that they are bad and they believe they are bad statistically, they will be bad. They will misbehave. If a child is told over and over that they are stupid, they will act stupid. They will struggle to get good grades and to understand what is being taught. If a child is told over and over they're mean, chances are good that they will be mean. If a child is told over and over that they're lazy, there's a very good chance that they will act lazy. Conversely, if we repeatedly tell children that they are kind, that they are smart, that they are handsome or beautiful or helpful, they will believe that they are. And they will start acting that way. In a study on toddlers aged 13 to 15 months old, if they were helpful and, and they were told that they're helpful, oh, you're so helpful. That's so good. Thank you so much for helping. You are such a helpful person. They're twice as likely to help again as if they never received that praise. Twice as likely. And children who reported receiving more praise for pro-social pro acts, like helping out with housework, they showed fewer signs of depression at age 10 and 12. For more information on that, you can go to parentingscience.com. It's important for us to know that we are created for good works, good works, so that we can fully leave the old self behind and we can really embrace the new life that God has for us. A third verse on identity that I found very impactful is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are not like that. You are are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation. You are God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his marvelous, wonderful light. This verse speaks to many things that are important for us to be reminded of regularly. First, we are chosen by God. You are chosen. God wanted you in his family. That's pretty cool. That's a neat thought. Notice, too, that we are a chosen people, not a chosen 
person. So this is collective. This is plural language that is being used here. So not individuals, but we are, we are, we are one. We are a people. God loves when we are together and when we are unified. That's why all the language that's used in the prayer that Jesus taught us, which is called our Father, not my Father, right? It's all plural. Our Father. Forgive us, us, of our sins. It's not just me, forgive me of my sins, but forgive us of our sins because we are together. Second, we are royal priests. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. As Christians, because he is royalty, we are royalty. We are royalty. And we are priests because the work that we are called to do is to give God glory. The priesthood is loyal to God and God alone, meaning if God has said it, we are to obey it because he is the highest authority. Third, we are a holy nation. To be holy is to be set apart, is to be consecrated for the purposes of God. We are separated from sin and consecrated for God. We are set apart for God. We're not to look like or to act like the world or others that don't know God. These terms, chosen people, royal priesthood, and holy nation, those are all terms that were given to the Israelites in the Old Testament. And now in Second Peter in the New Testament, they're given to all of us as New Testament believers as well. This verse continues not in identity, but it continues in purpose. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. We are not saved just to be saved. We are saved with a purpose. We are saved to tell others about Jesus, to tell others about the good news, which is the great commission to go out into all the nations, make disciples. That's who we are. That's who we are. Another identity piece for us to keep in mind is that we are the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll start in verse 12, where it says, the body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged all the different parts in the body, every one of them, as he wanted them to be. Not only in our own bodies, but in the body of Christ, as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts 
should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Church, that is us. If one part of us suffers, we all suffer. If one part of us is honored, we are all rejoicing with each other. It's essential that we all recognize we are part of a larger whole, of which Colossians and Ephesians says, Jesus is the head of the church. No one can take the place of Jesus as the head of the church. Jesus and Jesus alone is the leader and head of the church. Last Saturday, we went to the Leisure Center. Kids wanted to go swimming and down the water slide and off the diving board and too hot for the hot tub, but we did everything else. And it was a lot of fun. And there was, obviously, there was other people there. And one of the guys that was there was running off the diving board, doing front flips. And then he'd go to the end of the diving board, he'd turn around and he'd do a back flip. And I just, honestly, I love flips. I think they're cool. And I'm, I guess I'm pretty easily impressed. I'm, I'm impressed by a flip. Front flip, back flip, doesn't matter. I'm impressed. And so no one now has learned to do the front flip off the diving board. The girls are doing flips on the trampoline. I'm even more impressed if you can do a flip and you're confident to do it on the ground like this and land safely, please. And uh, I, I just, I'm impressed by flips. And so when I was younger, I decided, you know, they're so impressive. I want to figure out how to do this. I want to I wanna do a flip. And so I decided at about 10 years old, I was going to learn how to flip off of the diving board. And so I figured it out. But it wasn't until someone pulled me aside and said to me, listen, here's the secret. The secret to do a flip is to lead with your head. That doesn't make sense. My feet are the one things that I have to go around and land on. No, lead with your head, they said. All right. And once I figured that out, once I incorporated that into my technique, it worked and I could flip. And that's exactly why Jesus is the only one that is able to take the position as head of the church. As humans, we're not perfect. We don't see perfectly. We don't hear perfectly. We don't recognize every situation for what it is and we can miss the mark. For the church to accomplish its mission Jesus needs to be head of the church. He needs to be the leader. He needs to be the direction setter of the church. For the church to properly fulfill its call to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, we need Jesus to lead us. And for that to happen, we also need the diversity of the people of God, of all of the people of God, to be working together. We all need to be working together to accomplish this great and massive goal that God has given us, that Jesus gave us in the Great Commission. Each person's skill set, each person's experiences are important and to be used in ministry to reach the lost. There's no gift or calling that is more important than all the others. They're all equally important. All callings and all giftings are equally important. So here's something I've noticed of professional sports. Do you notice that a lot of soccer players all look the same? They're all about the same height. They're all about the same build. They're all pretty skinny. All they do is run, right? They run and jump and kick and block. That's, what they, that's the whole game of soccer. This is not a soccer fan speaking, so please don't chastise me. But uh, there's not... There, that, that's the game of soccer, right? Most baseball players look about the same, they have about the same build. They have about the same height. They look quite similar. But 
And basketball players, they all look about the same. They're taller than other, sport, other athletes, but they all look about the same. Because they're all just running and shooting and jumping and blocking. It's like, it's like soccer, but up in the air. <laughs> but a professional football team, American football, totally different. Right? Totally different. It's the sports team that best represents the church. I know it's a crazy statement, but, but hear me out. A professional football team has guys that are absolutely enormous on the offensive line and on the defensive line. Huge, huge guys. And then wide receivers, running backs, they can be small. They can be very small. And so you have uh, these huge guys on the O-line. You have these small guys as running backs or wide receivers. And you have everyone in between, plus the guy that used to play soccer and can kick it a mile. Right? You have all of those guys. Currently, the smallest NFL player is Deuce Vaughn. Any guesses on how tall Deuce Vaughn is? 4'3". No. <laughs> He, he would last one play if he was 4-3. <laughs> Deuce Vaughn stands at a whopping 5 foot 4. I'm quite a bit taller than him. And he weighs 176 pounds. So I'm 8 inches taller and... Not quite 20 pounds heavier than him. Now, the biggest NFL player out there right now is Daniel Falele. Any guesses on how large he is? Six foot eight. We got a fan back there. Right there. Any guesses on how much he weighs? 380 pounds. So from here to here, the smallest NFL player to the biggest NFL player, that's just currently. That's currently. Right now, playing together, they could play each other. That's quite a bit of a height difference. And that's over 200 pounds in weight difference. That's more than me in weight difference between those two professional football players. So from one extreme to the other and everybody in between. Just like an NFL team or a CFL team needs people of all sizes, needs athletes of all sizes. So too the church needs a diversity. We need... we. we an NFL team or CFL team cannot be made up of only quarterbacks or only running backs or only offensive line, only defensive line. There needs to be a, a diversity of positions. In the church, we can't all be preachers. We can't all be greeters. If we were all greeting, who's going to do everything else? Who's going to look after the kids? We can't all be hosts making the coffee. But you know what? We do need hosts. We need home group leaders. We need greeters. We need preachers. We need people to lead the service. We need sound guys. We need sound people. We need all of the different ministries to be fulfilled. We need a diversity of people to be ministering where they are gifted, where they are passionate. We are all part of a larger body that Jesus is the head of. That's why it's essential it's essential that we work through our issues. When we are offended, when we are upset, when we are hurt by one another, don't just, well, I'll just ignore it. I'll just, don't worry about it. No, if it's bothering you, you need to talk to that person. You need to work through the repentance and the forgiveness that is needed. We can't gossip about each other and pretend it's okay. We can't hurt each other like the world does. When we hurt another believer, 
We're hurting ourselves because we're all part of one body. We're hurting Jesus because he is the head of that body. In North America, our tendency is to isolate ourselves, is to pull away, to segregate ourselves from other people. But in the biblical understanding of who we are, we are not only members of the same church, we are members of the same body. What we do affects each other. We should have more in common than we have differences because we are all part of the body of Christ. That's who we are. Too often we're criticized. We were reminded over and over again of the mistakes and all the different ways that we don't measure up. To be fully honest with you, criticism has never helped me to grow, has never motivated me properly, has never inspired me, has never birthed a desire to be better. Instead, it's given me a desire to hide my mistakes, to conceal them, to cover them up, make sure my flaws aren't visible, and to make sure that I'm not being vulnerable in sharing them with others. But if we want something different in life than what we have been experiencing, then we need to give ourselves new experiences. If you want to really live for God, then you need to know who you are. And you need to know what you're capable of. Our final verse for today that I believe is important for this season is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. By his divine power. God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. You have everything you need to live a godly life. To, you have everything. Lots of times when we get to a situation, it might be tempting or it might be easy to just say, give the excuse and say, I, I'm not equipped. I'm not ready. I can't do that. Well, this verse says you can. You have everything you need. Now, you may not have it right with you in that moment, but maybe you can call someone else in the body of Christ and say, hey, listen, can you help me with this? I need help with this. Can you help me figure this out? I need someone to do this. We have everything we need to live a godly life. Everything. Tara, can I get you to come play the piano, please? For real change to happen, we each, as individuals and as a church, we each need to know who we are. We need to know what we are called to. We need to know what we are capable of. We need to understand our true identity, as the Bible says. Not as culture says, but as the Word of God says. That's where your true identity comes from as a believer. So I want to take some time now to read through all the different things in Scripture that that are declared, that are said of who we are. And then we're going to wait on God. We're going to just take some time as individuals to just sit and wait to hear from God. Because you need to hear from God for yourself. I can tell you a thousand times that you are marvelous and that you, you were made wonderfully by God but until you hear that from him until you receive that revelation from him it's just words but you need to know that you are marvelously created you are not a mistake and there's so many other things that you need to know about who you are and so we're going to take a few minutes after I'll read through the whole list and then we'll just wait on God to speak We are. You put that up there. I don't know if you can zoom in and take a picture of that, but please do. We are children of God. 
We are branches of the true vine, Jesus. We are friends of Jesus. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are free from the law of sin and death. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are accepted by Christ. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are called to be saints. We have wisdom. We have righteousness. We have sanctification. We have redemption. We are temples of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. We are God's temple. We are joined to the Lord. We are one spirit with the Lord. We are led in triumph. We are new creations in Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are one with all who are in Christ Jesus. We are heirs of God. We are free in Christ. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We are blameless before God. We are predestined by God to obtain an inheritance. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We are alive in Christ. We are seated in the heavenly places with Christ. We are God's workmanship. We are created to produce good works. We are near to God. We are members of the body of Christ. We are partakers of Christ's promise. We are welcome in the presence of God. We were formerly darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. We are children of light. We are the light of the world. We are called into light. We are citizens of heaven. We are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are provided for. We are made complete in Christ. We have been raised up with Christ. We are seated with Christ. We are hidden with Christ in God. Christ is the center of our lives. We will be revealed with Christ in glory. We are more than conquerors. We are God's possession. We are justified. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are righteous. We are healed. We are holy. We are beloved. We are chosen. We are loved. That's who we are. Isn't that amazing? That's who we are in Christ. And so, Harley, if you could keep that slide up. Let's take a few minutes. And, and you need to hear from God today on who you are. Because that'll change what you do for today and every day. So hear from God today on who you are. Let's take a few minutes now and just let God speak to you about at least one of those.
I hope you've heard from God about who you are. And if you haven't yet, then I encourage you later today when you have some time or make time to look at this list again and ask God, going over the list, who am I? Who do you really want to speak? What do you really want to reveal to me about who you've made me to be in Christ? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all the different things that you have uniquely and wonderfully and marvelously made uh, for us and in us, for us to be, for us to do. We thank you for who you have made us to be. Pray, Lord, that as we get revelation, not just on one of these aspects of who we are, but on all of them, Lord. Pray that you would continue to speak to us about each and every one of them. We would never forget who you have made us to be, who we are individually, who we are collectively. And Lord, that 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 would change our perspective completely. That would change how we interact with each other. That would change how we interact with those that don't know you. And that would increase our urgency to help other people to know you. Pray, Lord God, that you would be honored and glorified even more in our lives as we truly grasp who we are. Amen. Today, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, then this list is not true of you yet. It can be, and it can be today. You can trade your life of sin for the life of salvation and sanctification, which is being made holy. You can trade that. Trade your life of sin for the life that Jesus has for you. And if you want to do that today, I'm going to lead us all in a prayer. And if you respond, and if you say that prayer with sincerity, at the end, I'm going to ask if you just come and raise your hand and let us all know that you prayed that prayer and that you traded your life of sin for the life of salvation that God has for you. We want to celebrate with you. It's not to point you out and to embarrass you. We want to celebrate with you because that's a life that has changed for this life and for all eternity. And so we want to celebrate. So if you decide to say this prayer that we're going to say in just a moment, please let us celebrate with you. And we also have resources to give you, to help you on your journey with Jesus, to make sure that you continue to grow deeper and deeper with him. If you're online, just type in the comments, I'm giving my life to Jesus. And if you're here with us, after we say this prayer, would you please put up your hand? Everyone taking that step of faith today. Or if you've said this prayer before, please join in with me and repeat after me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I surrender to you. Jesus, forgive my sins. Be my Savior. Be Lord of my life. Help me follow you to do your will and live out your love. I thank you for forgiveness. Your spirit, your love, and this new life. My life is not mine. I give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, if you gave your life to Christ today, would you please just be so bold to lift up your hand and let us celebrate with you. We want to join with you and celebrate and thank God for a new life in Christ. Just put up your hand right now if you prayed that prayer for the first time. Well, even if you 
did and didn't put up your hand, we still want to celebrate with you. And I'd love to give you some resources on your way out. Or Pastor Adrian, who gave the announcements, would love to give you some resources on your way out as well. So if you want prayer for any reason, prayer team, if you could come forward now. But we want to, we want to be a church that prays that prays for each other, that lifts up our request to God together. And so if you have any prayer needs, any prayer needs at all, if you need God to come through in any situation, or if you have a, a person in your life that's really close to you, that they need prayer, they are in a desperate situation, let's join in prayer together. And so if you need prayer for any reason, please come forward. We would love to pray with you. But right now, we're going to dismiss. There's snacks and there's coffee out in the foyer. There's people to go and get to know that are also part of the body of Christ. And so I want to encourage you to go and be the church, to invite people to come with you next week. Every week is Visitor's Week. Every week is a great week to bring a visitor, a great week to bring a friend or a neighbor that doesn't know Jesus or that isn't in a church bring them. We'd love to get to know them. We'd love to be blessed by them and by their presence. So God bless you. Go and be the church. Go have some snacks and go out and be part of the Great Commission to make disciples of all the nations. God bless you.